I will continue my series of sermons uh, called How to Keep Devil Out of Your Life. And today will be the part two. Up to 19th century, everywhere in the world, in all cultures, and in every part of the planet, cities had the protective walls. Whenever you go, uh, you will see the same thing in every, in every part of the world. Cities were fortified with the walls for the reasons of protection, to keep people safe inside of the wall. The thicker the wall is, the bigger and more safe and safer the people will be behind them. So that, was, that was the idea. The higher, the thicker the wall, the more safe place it possibly could be. So that was the idea behind it. The stronger and the highest. And if you will go to the um, absolutely almost every uh, city in the Asian world, you will see the same picture. This is the part of the Asian uh, wall surrounding the most beautiful city, Babylon. Huge wall which was built by King Nebuchadnezzar. And he was proud that he was the one who made even a several walls around the city. So uh, the city was almost impregnable uh, for any size of the army. Uh, but some people, they did even, uh, they surrounded the whole country with the walls like China. This is the uh, Great Wall of China. They thought, why the city if we can surround ourselves with the wall, the whole country? And even the cities in the times of Israelites, they have been building the dwellings and surrounding them with the walls. And the Bible says in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 14, verse 7, Let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers, gates, and bars. So every city which Israelites, the people of God, built, they built with the surrounding protecting walls. And even Jerusalem, one of the biggest, the capital of Israelites, was built with a huge wall around it. And some of it still in existence until today. Uh, the protective wall around Jerusalem had uh, 2.5 meters or 10 feet high. Uh, 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 I apologize, 10 feet wide and uh, 40 feet high. That's kind of a huge wall and it was built by king solomon first book of king chapter 3 verse 1 solomon finished building his palace and the temple of the lord and the wall around jerusalem but what is interesting that even the heavenly city new jerusalem will have a wall a wall of protection book of revelation chapter 21 and verse 12 says it, speaking about New Jerusalem, it says it had a great high wall with 12 gates. But if you will go, go back to the Old Testament, the prophets will explain you what kind of walls will be in New Jerusalem. Let's go to the book of, Jer uh, book of Zechariah, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Jerusalem... He speaks about that Jerusalem, the new one, that's Zechariah, the prophecy about the future. And he says, the Jerusalem will be a city without walls. But continue reading, and it says, because of the great number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around him, declare the word, and I will be its glory within. So when we speak, about New Jerusalem, God says that city will have the wall of fire, meaning that God himself will be the wall protecting the city. Today we'll continue our two-part series on how to keep the devil out of my life. Uh, in the first part called Knowing His Plans, we, uh, we discuss the plans and strategies of Satan. Uh, we spoke on how he is getting up, 
what he is doing, what he putting out there, so uh, to snare us into his uh, uh, into his ideas and his place where he wants us to be. And uh, we mainly uh, spoke on one verse from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, where, where Jesus is disclosing the strategy of Satan. And this is the verse we uh, focused on the last time. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So we took one word at a time. Uh, of this strategies and plans of Satan wh who is called thief in this verse well and uh, today we will continue with uh, the second part how to keep devil out of your life and uh, the title of this sermon and uh, is the wall of protection how to build the wall of protection surrounding your life how to keep him out of your life and what that wall is what stands between you and him and what practical things you can do in your life to make sure that he will not get in and our main verse will be taken from the book of Peter chapter 5 verse 8 and we will be talking about only one verse in the Bible. For first book of Peter, chapter 5, verse 8. If it is easy for you to follow your own Bible on your own device, you're welcome to do that. You can open first book of Peter, chapter 5, verse 8. If not, you can follow it on a screen or follow it uh, on when we share the screen to those who are joining us. On Let's read it together. Be alert of sober mind your enemy is the devil prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to devour this is first book in chapter 5 verse 8 but i like it more in uh, king james version so i will read it to you uh, be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour that's King James Version. The Apostle Peter, an experienced elder, and as a good shepherd, he warns of the coming dangers. The universal fact of life, devil will be attacking you. If you think it will not happen to you, you're deeply mistaken. No one, absolutely no one, no person, no living creature on this planet will not be exempt from the attack of Satan. Believers, unbelievers, every single one. More than Peter said, those who believe, they experience tremendously like a tenth a hundred times more attacks from satan because he wants to get even those who are elect so those who opted for salvation they get satan's attack ten times more so if you think that Satan will not attack you, you are mistaken. Every single one will be attacked and is being, is receiving the attacks every single moment, whether we like, whether we realize it or not. Remember we spoke the last time that first he steals in a way that we don't even recognize that we have been robbed. So Peter says everyone will experience attacks from the satan so you need to know how to protect yourself and god gives us all the tools what to do and how to protect ourselves and that's what we're going to be talking about today first uh mm, before we're going to go into the tax itself let's bow our heads again and we'll ask 
that God will have a special anointing on each and every one of you. So you will recognize the areas in your life which have been under attack of Satan. And God will give you the power and protect you. So you will survive and you will come to the very end and Jesus will come and I will say this is my servant. God who is in heaven, have a merciful and loving Jesus as we are living in the end times. Knowing what is happening around us, seeing how the world falls so quickly and we are almost reaching the bottom of it and we see how the world's event unfold before our eyes and we see that every single day brings us something new but it's not new because we have known that for a long time God has revealed through the prophecies that the end will go this way and we see it happening in our eyes bless us as we experience in tremendous attacks of Satan on each and every one of us and help us to protect ourselves help us to see how what you do to protect all of us and let today's deliberation on the Word of God especially this verse in the first book of Peter help us to stay strong and under your protection this is my prayer in the name of Jesus Amen first book of Peter chapter 5 verse 8 and we will begin from the end of the verse be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour and we will start from the last verse from the last word in a verse devour this is a Greek word katapinio it means to swallow to swallow in a sense of a drink to swallow like you know like whole thing swallow at the same time it's not chewing it's not uh, leaving something behind it's swallowing something so completely that there are there is nothing left even the juices will be swallowed so when he swallows the Satan it swallows everything uh, one of the uh, the same word is used in the book of Revelation 12, 16, so you will get an idea what is behind this verse. And the earth held the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So completely, totally swallow up. Uh, and when we read the text that the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, you see the picture of a lion who is pursuing its victim. He kills and then he swallows up everything what he kills. There's nothing left. Even the juices which may, you know, drop from his mouth, he swallows it up. So his idea is to swallow you up completely. Nothing will be left of you. What he does He's not, his intention not to wound you, but his intention is to devour you completely. So nothing will be left of you. Even juices he will swallow up. And this image Peter is using to show what Satan will do to a man. This is his intention. He pursues, he bullies you, he kills, and then he drinks you up completely. And now let's look at the stages of season which we see in this verse. And the first one, he, uh, Peter calls him adversary. That's his first kind of a name and a title and a description of Satan. He is called an adversary. And this is the interesting name, uh, word in, in Greek, antidikos. Antidikos means it is a lawyer 
of the persecutor's office. He is on the side of the persecution. It's like a DA. Uh, so devil, he is the persecutor. What he does is almost like, you know, the lawyer of the persecution side, the do. Uh, that's, he need, uh, there should be a crime. He needs to investigate the crime. He needs to find evidence as the, of the crime. He needs to catalog them. And he needs to bring the charges against you. And that's what the Satan is doing. So he, the adversary or the persecutor, his goal is to prove you guilty. So there will be no doubt. Once I was in a, in a jury duty, and by the way, they just sent me last month that I have to go again for the jury duty. So you have to be convinced. Yeah, that's a week out of your life. But, but I take it seriously, yes. You have to be convinced beyond the reasonable doubt that you're guilty. And that is the job of the persecutor's office. To convince you beyond the reasonable doubt you are guilty. And your place is behind the bars. You have to carry the burden of a crime. This is exactly what Satan is doing. He watches you closely. He's looking for any little or big violations which you commit in life. He records it each and every Every time you break the law, first to know is him, Satan, because he puts it on the record. This man, this woman broke the law, guilty. And here is the mounting evidences that it happened. He collecting and evidences on me and you every single moment of my life. And most likely have a thick book like that of the evidences which is against me. And the same goes for everyone. He works for the persecutor's office. And he does everything legally with evidences which incriminates you to the crimes. He's digging dirt on all of us. And if you think that no one sees what you do, <laughs> you're probably so deeply mistaken. Look what Ellen White says. The book Christian Experience and Teachings of Ellen White. Satan and his angels mark all the means and covetous acts of these persons. She's talking about Christians. And present them to Jesus and his holy angels, saying reproachfully, These are Christ's followers. They are preparing to be translated. <laughs> Meaning, they are preparing to go to heaven. Satan compares their course with passages of scriptures in which it is plainly rebuked and then towns the heavenly angels saying these are our followers following Christ and his word these are the fruits of Christ's sacrifice and redemption angels turn in disgust from the scene Satan and his angels are in the business of collecting all information on us the ins and outs all transgressions all the words all the deeds they document it and bring it before the court in heaven and says look at them for these people you have died Peter says, 
Satan, he does everything right by the book. He wants to destroy you legally. So he brings the mountain of the evidence against you. Look at them. They have committed the violation. They have broken your law numerous times. They go against the word which you said. And he knows it all. He's the first to know when we sin. When we are disobedient to God, Satan knows it first. Because he is right there to document my disobedience to my God. And then, if you are disobedient to God, Satan walks freely in your life. He has a legal right to walk in your life and be in your life when you are disobedient to God. By breaking God's word, you give Satan the legal right to walk in your life. And Satan shows the evidence and says, look at them, Jesus. They gave me permission to be in their lives. Legally, and no one can do anything. For this purpose, God gives us a protection. God says, I know it. But to protect you, I give you the wall. And that wall is the law of God. That wall is my word. My word is a protection for you. My law is not there to limit you in something. My law is there to protect you. I'm giving you the law so the law will be a fence, a wall around you. So when the Satan will come in at you, you will put a wall of protection, my law and my word. And it will stop devil right there. The law is not something what limitates you in life. It's not something which we call dawns in my life. No. That's not what I have to kind of a huh, to give up in my life. That is the protection which God put in places so Satan will not break in. The law and the word of God. And when we break the law, we give Satan the legal rights to walk in. says whatever is broken in your life I am there to restore it God rebuilds the wall of protection around your life whatever you see the bridge in the wall God says I am able to rebuild it this is why the whole actually two books of the Bible are dedicated to the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem when God sends his people back to Jerusalem to what to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem because it, it is so important that the wall will have will be in your life and will be protecting you from break-ins of, of devil in inside of your life if you still think that the wall of the law is not important of your life you are deeply mistaken you let in him to freely walk in your life. And it's not legalism. It's a protection. Take the word of God seriously if you haven't done it yet. 
take the law of God seriously if you haven't done it yet in your life. That is the real wall, wall of protection designed by God for your personal life. It's not a limitation. It is a protection designed especially for you. Restore the wall if it is broken. If you have bridges there, restore it. Second, second description of devil and Satan. We follow in the same verse. Peter calls him the devil. Uh, and a Greek word for devil is diabolos. It is a combination of two words. The first one, dia, which means uh, carries the idea of penetration, of breaking through. And the second word is uh, balo. Balo uh, uh, means to throw or to beat or to attack. Uh, when you put these words together, you will get an idea uh, that uh, the one who throws, who beats, who attacks with the intention to penetrate, with the intention to break it. So that's the word which means devil. Devil is the one who will be attacking you, who will be beating you until you will lay it down. Until, until he will break your defense, until you will be penetrated. And he does it constantly. He never stops beating you. He never stops attacking you, penetrating your life. That's the word devil. Devil is ruthlessly attacks you constantly until he will break you down. If he will not be stopped, everyone will be in the ground. He is powerful, he is ruthless, and he never stops. He never sleeps. He does it 24-7. So that's the devil. And Peter says, look what he's doing. He, he will be beating you, throwing things at you until your defense will be done. And the third image of Satan. He is a roaring lion. Peter chooses the image of a roaring lion for many reasons, but I will mention only two. Uh, he shows... Uh, the state of the mind of Satan and his reasons by calling him the roaring lion. It's two things I want to mention, maybe more than that, but I limited on time. The first, uh, he compares, why he compares him to the roaring lion is this, because well, the lion, lions roar for many reasons. One of them, one of the main reasons why they uh, roar hungry. They want to eat. When you hear of the lion, you know that probably he is uh, hungry. As it is says in the book of Psalm 104, verse 21, one, the young lions roar after they pray and seek their meat from God. So they let God knows I'm hungry. Send me something on my way. So roars, uh, roar tells you that uh, the lion is hungry and when you will be in florida guys uh, you probably go to florida often uh, you may go to adventist camp kulakwa uh, close to jackson will not mistaken uh it's a beautiful place uh at now adventist facility and you uh, the, uh, you will be waking up every morning to the roars of a lion because they have a real size zoo right there in the premises. So every morning you will hear how that mighty roar of a lion. Because the lion is hungry and he, want, he wants to eat something. Well, so the devil roars because he's hungry. He wants to eat. What is the food of the lion? Of the sea? What he is feeding himself with. He 
feeds on you. He takes your life to prolong his life. Have you thought about that? That Satan is not immortal. As soon as he disobeyed and sinned in heaven, what happened? God cut him off from the source of life. Now Satan is not going to live forever. Remember, Bible says, everyone who sins, what? Will die. You will surely die. It is also, you can apply to, to Satan himself. As soon as he disobeyed, he is doomed to die. And Satan is dying. He is getting older and older, and he knows that just a little bit and he will die. He will not be living forever. He is not immortal. He doesn't have life in himself. We used to think, well, it's always when we speak about Satan, we kind of uh, make him equal to God. Like, you know, when we talk about God, he is there like forever, right? So when we speak about Satan, somewhere deep inside, we think that Satan is there forever. No. Satan is not God. He does not have life in, a, in himself. He's not going to live forever. And he knows that his frame of life is limited. He has an end. And when God cut him off from the source of life, Satan is trying to find the alternative way to support his life. To prolong his life. Where in the universe Satan could find an alternative supplies of life? If not from God. From you and me. The only creatures in the universe which have and possess the life which belongs to God is you and me. By devouring us. He prolongs his own life. Because he wanted, desperately want to stay alive. He thinks that he can fool God. And he can stay alive by stealing the life from different sources. But Satan is dying. The universal law says as soon as you sin, you will Each and every time we give in to Him, we surrender our own life, our eternal life, and we give it to Him. By taking it, He thinks and He wants to prolong His own life. In a way, this is the whole plan of deception of Satan. He thinks, all right, there is Adam and Eve. What are I going to do? I will deceive them so they will surrender whatever they have to me. That's the whole plan of Satan. He wants to deceptively take the life which does not belong to him. To prolong his own. Don't feed Satan. Don't prolong his life. And we do that by sinning, by surrendering ourselves to him. And he gladly takes my life. Remember we spoke in the first part, he is a thief. He takes what does not belong to him. Life belongs to God and God gives it. And God says, I will give it to you permanently, forever, at one thing, when it all will be finished. Now we live in this life on a probation basis. But when it will be finished, I will give you that life and you will live forever with me. And Satan knows that. He tries to deceive God so he will live forever. 
by taking what belongs to you. Say, hungry. And know that he's dying. Know that he has an end. This is why he's so furious at the last days because he sees with his own eyes his life disappearing. And this is why the picture in the book of Revelation, how God will confine him. He will take away the food from him. The food are us. There will be no people to deceive. So that's number one, why he is a roaring lion. He is hungry. He is looking for alternative sources to stay alive. The second, lions roar to show off the size, to intimidate. It seems like, uh, I didn't know that, but lions roar to show how big they are. Uh, evidently, the other lions or other predators could judge the size of the animal by the roar which it produces. So it roars, even if no one sees him, they hear him and they imagine, all right, this is a big lion, better not to mess up with him. So lions roar to intimidate, to show how big they are. So, and that's what Peter says. Satan is intimidating you. He shows you the muscle and he says, I'm big, don't mess with me. If you're going to stand in my way, I will destroy you. I will eat you up. I will devour you. If you will be on my path when I am after the prey, most definitely I'll put you down. Look what Ellen White says. Great controversy, page 514. Uh, Satan raged like a chained lion and defiantly exhibited his power over the bodies as well as the souls of men. So Satan is a roaring lion and he defines all other authorities and he takes over, look what he, the body and the soul of man. So he goes after you physically mentally and spiritually but look at the first part of the sentence you see the picture of a mighty huge animal but on a leash God says Satan is chained he is on a chain no matter how evil how big how powerful how strong that animal is god says i keep it on a chain it will not get you it will it will it, it can run around but only limited by the length of a chain god says i put him on a chain He's not going to get everywhere he wants to, uh, to go. He's not going to get those people who are under protection of God. He is limited in what he can do. God did not give Satan a wild card to anything he wants. It seems like it's not, we don't see it with our own eyes, but it, it is very... <laughs> difficult to see that in our world but God says everyone goes as I allow it to go seems like it's not when we look around us right seems like Satan gets everyone everything what he wants but God says no he is on a chain maybe the chain is seems like longer today and it's getting longer but still, as he is chained. God does not allow him to do everything what he wants. He will do a lot of things. Remember, Job, God allowed Satan to do a lot of things in his life. Take away the children, the property, everything boils 
of airships. The chain air bomb and his jewel. But that says still he is on a chain. So that's good news. He's roaring. He's he is intimidating, but he is chained. Then Peter moves to advices. And he gives us two advices and I'll read them to you. The first one, be sober. Be sober in a time like that. And then be sober is a Greek word, nepho. It means, be sober, it means not, not intoxicated. It stands and it is, it means to be from delusion, from ideas which he throws at us. The opposite word for sober is drunk. So either sober, there are, there are two states of mind, either sober or drunk. There is nothing kind of a, uh, uh, no third definition for that. And uh, we know the condition of a drunk or under the influence, it's not necessarily the alcohol only, but whatever the substance uh, are. So we know what happens to us when, when, uh, when a person is drunk. We are less careful in life, right? When a person is drunk, that person does something what he normally wouldn't do. Because the, the defense is down and people do something what in a sober mind they would never ever do but in a drunk condition that's easy people say things when they normally would never ever say soberly they would never say that but being drunk they say a lot of things the mouth is untied. Defense barriers are, are being breaking down when a when person is he as a sober person. The shame perceived differently in a sober and a drunk person. A drunk person can do a lot of shameful things, which the same person feels shame afterwards. But in a being in a state of a drunk, he doesn't feel that shame. He does it. Well, uh, the drunk person does not pursue his own danger, which come in his way. He is more brave. Because he does not calculate the risks anymore. He goes. So his defense is lowered down. Drunk cannot correctly assess the danger and the situation around himself. The drunks know not what they do. Ask them afterwards what he was or she was doing. I have no idea. I don't remember. Don't recall anything. Not knowing what they do. They don't even realizing what the actions of them are. To give someone a drink is to lower is natural defense which we do have as humans and Satan is doing that on purpose he wants to lower every and any defense we have so we will be vulnerable we will not assess correctly the danger we'll do stupid things and he wants to keep us in that way as long as he could Book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, 
wherein is access, but be filled with the Spirit of God. And Satan's job is to keep us conditioned forever without a clear judgment, to keep us uh, as those who do not know what they do. That is his idea. Don't even think about it. Don't even realize what you do. Don't even think and reason what you do. You don't have to do that. Just live your life. Don't reason. Remember God says, sit down with me and reason. I will reason with you. But Satan says, no, you don't have to reason with anything. Just do it. You don't have to realize what you are doing. This is the way of life, says Satan. Life for a drunk, says Satan, is easy. You don't have to think about anything. Just be, live a clouded life. This is escape from reality. This is it. If a drunken man stands guard over the city, what will happen to the city? The city will be taken over. And we do have a historical evidence of this written in the Bible, of course. Book of Daniel, chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 4. Ancient Babylon and a drunken chief, commander in chief. The commander in chief of the army of Babylonian is getting drunk. Look what happened to the city. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousands. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which the father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. So he is drunk and he doesn't realize what he is doing, what is what is holy, what is common. And he brings the vessels from the holy temple. Even Nebuchadnezzar never done it before. But Belshazzar being drunk brings the utensils from the temple of the Lord and starts wine from cups. They drank wine, praised their gods of gold and silver, of brass and iron, of wood and stone. On Shether, what he was doing at that very moment. Everything was blurred before his eyes. As usual happens before the eyes of a drunken man, mine. He was not able to make a difference between holy and unholy. And symbolically, he crossed that line and what happened right after that in the very same time of course being drunk they even forgot to give the orders to close the river gates and the armies marched in and the same night the Babylon was taken because the commander of the army of Babylonia, the chief one, and all the thousands, it says, the commanders. So all the chain of commands who gives the order and protect, protecting the people in the city were drunk. All the lords of the Babylon were drunk that night. Everyone. And as, as a result, the Babylon was fallen the same night under the command of a drunken people. In the New Testament, at the time of Jesus, Jesus himself testified about the people who do not know what they do. People who lived in delusions of Satan. When he was on the cross, he was praying for the people who had been drunk with the wine of Satan. 
which surrounded the cross and he said father forgive them for they know not what they do that was the definition of the people being drunk on the wine of satan The Bible says there will be many drunk people in our time before the second coming of Christ. And Satan will do his job meticulously to keep everyone drunk at the time of Jesus' second coming. So we will not know what to do. We will not realize what is happening. We will be having easy state of mind. Our world is befuddled with the wine of Satan. Our world is filled with, with whatever spiritual wine Satan is spreading out. People are unable to think clearly, confused, perplexed on issues and whatever. We are perplexed and confused in every single part of our lives, including even our bodies. People are so confused, they don't know what to do with that. People are confused with the mind, with the psychic, with the body, with the physical aspects of life, with whatever happens, with the events, with the time. People are really living in a confused world and with a confused mind. And this is what Satan is doing this is his job he's happy he said i'm gonna be supplying you the wine so you will feel dull all the time and will not know what to do but jesus reminds us at this very time this is what i am expecting from you and he tells us the parable in chapter 12 gospel of luke but suppose the servant says to himself my master is taking a long time in coming and he then begins to beat uh, the other servants both men and women and to eat and drink and get drunk you see in the same in the same uh, description of the world parabolically jesus is speaking but he says the same thing the people this is what the people will be doing when they're not waiting for the coming of jesus they will be drunk with a lot of things which is which are happening around them the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers so being drunk he doesn't even wait anymore for the master to come and he doesn't realize what time is it and jesus says then i will come I will cut to pieces and assign him a place with the unbeliever. And he talks to his own servants. This is the parable about me and you, not about the world. This is you and me, those who profess and say that we are working for him and waiting for him. That's the parable personally to you and to me. Peter gives you an advice and me. The first thing, how to keep the devil out of your life. Be sober. Don't let Satan supply you with his wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit of God. Don't drink his wine. Be sober. Don't drink the wine of the media, which is around you 24 hours. The media is feeding you with a lot of, a lot of garbage, with a lot of violence. The more people, that's kind of a, not a secret, the more people are hooked up to the media, they cannot live a day or, well, an hour without being fed from, from the media the more violent people become, the more intolerant people become. It's everywhere now. You cannot hide yourself, but you could. And Bible says, be sober. 
do not drink wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. And a second advice from Pete, be vigilant. Be sober and be vigilant. And the Greek word for vigilant is Gregorio. Gregorio, if your name is Gregory, Greg, uh, your name comes from this Greek word and it means to be awake. It means not sleeping. It means to be on guard. And from this very word comes the word alarm. Uh, something what is always on, right? It's, it shows you that something is happening. When the violation happens, alarms go, goes off, and you know that something is happening. So this is the alarm. This is the Gregory. Uh, and why do people buy and install alarms? To know when you're being robbed. And something is happening. You need to know that. If you're going to be slipping until the morning, uh, you probably will, yeah, well, you're going to lose everything. So this is why we need an alarm. This is why we install ar alarms in our cars and our houses uh, to protect. So we know when something, then the, when the transgression is happening, we know it. And we know it for a reason. Why? To defend, to step in and do something, right? We know to do something. When, when the alarm goes off, we need to do something. Either get out of the house if it's a smoke alarm or protect if something happens, right? There is, if you're not going to be reacting to the alarm, there is no point of having the alarm. If you're going to be still slipping through the alarm, then probably no point of having it. So that's, the, that's what Peter is saying. Be, an alar be alarmed. Know what is happening and act accordingly. If you see the alarm, what is happening, you need to be alarmed. You need to be gathered together and stand your ground. Otherwise, slip on. Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming? That's an alarm. If you know that something is happening, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 3, John says, But if you do not wake up i will come like a thief and you will not know at what time i will come at you in revelation chapter 16 verse 15 look i come like a thief blessed is the one who stays awake and remains closed that is gregoria means this is the state of being fully awaken knowing what is happening God wake you for this time know that I'm coming you see the things which are happening around you with you now you know this is the time of the night when Jesus is coming if you will sleep on you will lose everything so Peter, as a good shepherd, he says, be sober, be vigilant, because you, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. And I will paraphrase you with my own words. The devil mercilessly attacks like a hungry and strong lion, looking for any loophole in your life, for any violations, for any transgressions of the spiritual law of God. And as the attorney of the persecution, he will try to use all his evidences to bring criminal charges against you and convict you and destroy you. Therefore, be sober. Don't drink the wine of Satan. Don't fall for Satan's dope 
Stay sane, be sober, be vigilant, keep the alarm on, be ready, be prepared. Good advices. Yeah. But I have to admit that we're losing this battle with Satan. We are losing it. We have so many holes in our wall of defense of life. And basically, it's only one hole is enough for him to get in. The wall, if you still see some parts of the wall standing in your life, it may be good. But if you have a breach in the wall, it means that the enemy is inside. Enemy does not destroy the whole wall around the city. What they need is to destroy either the gate or the bridge, the wall to get in. This is all what the enemy is needed. Just one small bridge to get in. And we have to admit that we have so many holes in our wall of defense that Satan walks freely inside of our city he walks there he lives there sometimes it's not a question anymore it's not a question how how to keep devil out of your life it's a question of how to drive him out of my life because he's already there for that i'm going to finish with one verse found in the book of james chapter 4 verse 7 submit yourself then to god Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's another additional advice from James. And he uses the word submit, which is a hupotasso. And it means, uh, it is a military term, which means submit to authority. Uh, it means uh, submission by rank. It means... Uh, uh, to take your own place in a chain of command. Let's say it says to the station battle and everyone goes where? To its own place. So everyone knows its own place. That's w w when a commander, uh, uh, you know, puts you on a, on a one line, everyone knows where to stand, right? Because everyone has its own place. So that's what it means to take your own place to submit yourself under authority of someone else. That's a military term. But there is another meaning in this word which is very beautiful. And I think that James had that meaning in mind when he was writing this verse. The other meaning of this word is to stand or hide behind someone's back. It's like, you know, like you stand in a line and you are behind someone else someone else is in front of you so the one who is in front of you he shields you from whatever is coming from the front it means to hide behind someone's back because hiding and submitting brings you brings you protection satan has already occupied us he broke all the defense systems in most cases, our walls are down or have severely, or are severely damaged. And he already walks freely in our lives. But James gives us an advice. He says, submit yourself. Stand behind someone. And that someone will protect you in life. And he says, that someone is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. If you will get behind his back, you will be saved. We can stand behind, behind the lawyer of defense. And he says, the lawyer of persecution is against you. But you can hide yourself behind the lawyer of defense. And he will be defending you. He says there is the roaring lion who is attacking you, but you can get behind the lion of Judah and he will protect you.
There is one who is diabolos, who throws at you, who wants to penetrate you and devour you, but there is one who is called the Messiah, the Savior, and he is the one who saves you from all the acts of Satan. On everything what Satan is doing to God says, I'm counteracting it. I'm protecting you from every and any attacks of Satan on you. So you can safely behind the back of Jesus Christ. And you can get yourself behind the wall of protection of God. This is what Zechariah said, that God himself will be a wall of fire around you, declares the Lord. And within you will experience and enjoy the glory of God. This is what God is doing to us. He never lives us alone, one and one, with attacking and ro roaring like a lion, Satan. God says, I will stand between you and him. If only you will want to stand behind me, not in front of me. That's where we want to be, uh, honestly, in our lives. We always run in front of God. And the most safe place is behind him, behind his back. How to keep devil out of your life? God says, be sober. Don't drink the wife of Satan. Be mind sharp. Get behind the wall of protection of his word, his law. It is designed by God to protect you. Anytime you break the commandment of God and his law, you give him, Satan, lawful reason to be in your life. And you can avoid it. Don't give it. Don't give in. You can get behind the word of God, which is the wall and God, which God designed. But most of all, God says, get behind my back. We have to admit that the wall will not work for me because I am sinful every morning. Right? God says, I'm giving you the wall of protection, but you break the law. Again, you broke the law, and again Satan comes in. So what do you want to do? What, what, what are the options then? God says, get behind me. Get behind the Messiah. And I will get you out safely. So this is the second part of our discussion of how to keep devil out of your life. Get behind the wall of protection. His word, his law, and he himself. His back. The back of Jesus is the best 